uh, as you can see here, this is the northern part of this uh, central Ostrobotnia region. We are now here. And um, these green lines are municipal borders, and these blue areas, these are groundwater aquifers. And as you can see, there are not that many. This distance is something like 120 kilometers, and in this wise, it's something like 70 or 80 kilometers. So, uh, in this area, there lives something like 60,000 people, and these are the only groundwater sources that we have. And uh, because of the ice age and the geology and the composition of the soil, uh, the more near we go to the coast. We are, this is the uh, groundwater aquifer which Kokkola uses. There's a lot of iron and manganese, and they are a big problem, so you have to get rid of, the, rid of those. So, there's like, if, if it says anything to you, there's like 30 milligrams per liter iron here due to the ice age. The further we go inland, the better is the groundwater quality. And uh, these are the places where we have utilities. We have our main, main wells here, and we are pumping something like, well, we have a permission to pump two and a half thousand cubic meters per day, and uh, another one here, and third one here, which is mutually owned by us and Water Cooperative of Cali. Yes. So this is shared. This is shared. And this is something we don't see very much in many places. And also geographically, which is quite interesting, where we are now, the level of ground is plus 45 from the sea. These wells we have here, they are plus 100. So uh -huh. we are on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Whichever way we go, besides towards the sea, because this is zero here, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't matter which way we go, the ground rises all the time. So do, do, do you need to pump water from these, these water sources to kind of... Yeah, we have, to pump, we have to pump, but it's uh, it's quite complicated because the top of our water tower, it's below ground, so we, we are pumping downhill. Yeah. Uh, also, there's water utility here in Toholampi, and they are taking their water from here. There are a lot of groundwater here. It's a lot of untapped resources. We have connection, and we are all the time buying some water from them. So it's like we are helping each other because the technically, with these levels, it's uh, hard to handle the pressure which is on the pipes when there's no no usage during the night. Okay, so this is the story now. What the the quality of this water that is close to the to the sea. Um, what are the main technology that you apply for getting rid of these soils? They they use chemical precipitation and filtration after that. We don't use anything because we have perfect water. No but the salinity is, is not it is not salinity is not a problem with that water even. It's like iron and manganese and organic substances. Uh, this is the situation nowadays. The history here, Kannus, our, our water cooperative, it was established in 1946, after the war. And um, people didn't know very much about this, and these are long distances, this is like 20 kilometers here. So, what we did first, we built wooden pipes and got water from river. We had 80 kilometers of wooden pipes here. And to become a customer, each household had to put one man to work for one month to build the pipe. Okay. So this is the history after the war. And after that they invented plastics and everything kept growing. There used to be a lot more smaller cooperatives here in this area, but during the years they molded into us, they came to and now there's only one large cooperative here in Ghana. Mm -hmm. There's the smaller ones, are, one is here and one is here, but they are really small ones compared to us. Did you keep the wooden pipes somewhere? 
they are in the ground, but because you know they have this hole, so we put plastic pipe in there. So they are in a really secure place. But I think what's here is that is a PC. Yeah, we have, we have one piece, you can see, I can show you. But then it was quite normal operations until 2009. Uh, the legislation started to be stricter, and this municipality, they took care of the waste mod. They had sewage, sewer and sewage plant. Where was it? Where was it from the start? Well, it, uh, no. The sewage plant is here, but... but the, when they started to do wastewater as well? Uh, 1969, and 1969. they built the uh, treatment plant at 1978. But 2009, municipality was in trouble. They had no trained employees. They had uh, they had no no money to renovate, and they didn't have political will to do to build up the system. So they turned to us, and we bought it. We bought the sewers, and we bought the treatment plant. And after that, we've been operating it. And we also there was this one thing. We made an agreement. They sold it to us. And we agreed to build sewers to the remoter areas. As you can see, the river goes here. So the people mainly live here. As you can see where the pipes are going. People live here and here and here. There's another smaller river here. So we made an agreement. Okay, we build the sewers. We make the infrastructure and connect people to that. That's what we've been doing for 10 years. We've built... 70 kilometers of sewers in the last 10 years, invest a few million euros to that. And that's what, what we are doing and on our part to, pro, to keep the living conditions here for that people would like to live here, stay here and would be able to providing modern services. Okay, the next big thing came when I started working here, the discussion was going on, but uh, I, <laughs> I have to be the one to pull it through. Uh, there was this lot there that I mentioned. They had their own potentiality here, operating in this area. And their problem was really problematic. Come on, what? A lot of iron, a lot of manganese, very expensive to purify. And not that many customers, because only roughly 3,000, 3,500 people live here. So they were in, 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 in trouble. So they approached us. Can you do something? Can we do something mutually? Can we, can we make something happen so that, that we could make a good agreement? So we made them an offer. Okay, you have 1,000 owners. They give their stock to us and we give them the membership of the cooperative. And in seven years, we harmonized the prices of water because they had three times higher price. They three times three, higher? Three times higher. Oh. So there was something for both of us. They got, well, I would like to argue better service, but, but, but at least cheaper price. What about then wastewater in Lotte? Okay, Sewerage. it doesn't show here, but the sewage is done by Kokkola. This is the large town here, roughly. 40,000 people, and these two former municipalities, this Lohtaja and this Kalvia here, uh, they joined Kokkola <coughs> 10 years ago, and what was left for municipality to do was sewage, and fresh water was done by companies. <laughs> so there's a big sewer built from here to here. So they're pumping the waste bottom from here and here to Kokkola and treating it there. And that happened after the municipal merge. Yeah, Before that, that, that they had their own... own they had their own and after the merger they started pumping the Kokkola. Well, at the time it would have been wise for these utilities to take over the waste water also, but it's a different story working with fresh water and then with the sewerage and sanitation and stuff like that, but it's it's really important thing still, and it's uh, when you do those together, the same utility, you can save some costs and at least strengthen your own organization. We have more people working with us than we would have if we only had fresh water. So that's the story. Nowadays we have a revenue annual turnover of 1.8 million. We are selling 1 million cubic meters of 
fresh water and treating 400,000 cubic meters of waste water. We have 3,300 owners and same customers, 3.3 thousand and well, we're trying to get better all the time. <laughs> it's a, and this aerial cooperation between different utilities, this is something really, which really gives us something. There's three of us smaller utilities and then Coca-Cola also. We do a lot of things together. We are friends in civil life also outside of work life. And we've been doing these, um, how do you say, these, um, right. these plans together which are required by law. And doing things together, helping each other out because that we can save costs and provide better service and stuff like that. Do you, do you refer to this uh, uh, Kuntien uh, Vesivallon Kehittämissuunnitelma? Yeah, also, also those, but also this, what you have to have, this risk management plan. Ah, safety yeah, yeah, varautumissuunnitelma. Sanitation safety plans, yeah, yeah, yeah. mutual right. in investments to some, some connections between utilities and stuff like that and this is something this is really interesting what I want to talk next this is an old map which was made by me but it's grown a bit these ones in purple we have this aerial regional association of water utilities which is called how do you say well the Association of Northern Finland Water Utilities. It was established at 1956. It was established because, you know, in Finland the financial market was really restricted after the war. There was no money in the banks. You cannot get loans. There were government grants to build water services, but they the government is here and we are here, so it, it needed some lobbying to do, to get the money to North. So what they did, the municipalities gathered all the people, the politicians, uh, managers of big companies, everyone who, who was something, gathered together, made this association and they, then they went to Helsinki with their hats off and he was, could you lend us some money so we can build water infrastructure here? But the politicians, they don't know anything about water services. So what they needed was they needed the assistance of managers of these utilities. So they were like this working group and then the association was comprised of the politicians and people who were something. Okay, they got the funding. In the northern part of Finland, if you look at the distances here and how sparsely this is populated, it's, it's, it's astonishing how wide the coverage of uh, centralized water infrastructure is because they got so good grants and financing to do it but it was done in 1980s so there was no need for the funding anymore or at least not that much but still you know the people working in the utilities the managers they had, they really liked working together and doing things together and making things go forward so what they did, they continued the association, but the politicians were out. It was now the association of the utilities. And we do a lot. We held a few annual seminars. We, we fund some research, in which is somewhat regionally focused. And there are new members. This one is a member now, and a whole this one, and also Sodankula and Kemi, Tornio, this the coverage is really, we have 45 members, 45 utilities, almost all the northern part of Finland. And we have uh, some members who are the firms who we are cooperating with, who we are buying things, a lot of this, and um, pipe well, manufacturer. manufacturers, valve manufacturers, pump manufacturers, banks and stuff like that. They, they are supporting members, so we have almost 80 members in total. And this is really good. This is this is really something we really want to be active and participate in the national nationwide discussion about how this sector is developed. But also we do things here regionally because it's a lot different to build pipes here than it is to here because you have to have three meters of soil, soil on top of the pipe so it doesn't freeze. 
Your name? Like, what is your view that, that that the politicians are not anymore involved in this regional water association compared to the earlier situation? Well, it doesn't matter that much, but still we uh, we keep really close contact to them because we know we know people that know people, so we try to yeah, yeah, keep yeah. them aware of what we are doing. Yeah, yeah. But the government financing to these schemes. It, it doesn't exist anymore, so we have to get the money from free market or from our customers and stuff like that. So, mm. but if you look at it, this is really interesting because maybe so there is no no funding at all from government. No, not anymore. They no. stopped it three years ago. But the thing is, mo most places have have centralized water now, so the need for the government funding it's not that big anymore. But they have gotten some to the most northern part of Finland because for these wastewater treatment plants. They have gotten some there, but uh, well, we got one of the last government financed project which is going on still, but it was one of the last we got the funding three years ago, and after that, they haven't given anything. But right. the per percentages have been something like 30% of government funding. But, not but, but as, as a whole in Finland, the government funding has been very, very limited. So that, for instance, I said Tampere, Kangasava, they have never got any money. Mm. In total, sums in average maximum 10% out of the total annual investments. And Except for some cases like Northern uh, and uh, the funding, Finland, uh, these key centers, etc. And then uh, what the funding has been over the last few tens of years, so that then more than the government then started has been partly to safeguard water supply so that then to have a connection from this utility to this one for that pipeline and as well to centralize waste for the treatment to build then collecting sugars support the construction of centralized waste for the treatment plant. They had this idea like 10 years ago, 15 years ago in, in the northern part at least well, in other areas, but here it's it's really easy to see that because the rivers go like this, it would be easy to build a sewer from here to the coast and then build one large treatment plant. But those projects never got to full speed. I think there's only one major project, which is one river basin north from here. They collected all these municipalities one. Treatment plant over the river to Kalaik. Yeah, the river Kalaik. Fish River, freely translated. But I'm not sure that these projects are not, in technical and financial point of view, actually. I'm not sure if, at least from also from environmental point of view, are these actually feasible? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure about that because if you think about it. I would really like to focus on what's the total effect to the river or the river valley because when you have a large plant you have a large problem with many things yeah. and it, yeah. it, it, it would be in, in many cases uh, they talked about it in this river valley river basin also but then they started counting the pennies together and decided no 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 this is never feasible at least if you think about the customer because Customer pays in the end. That's what I, <coughs> what I understood when we discussed this about some years back. These fellows from the Kalayaki, where they decided to have only one waste centralized waste for the plant. But if I got it correctly, was that they were, their estimate was based that they are going to get governmental uh, support also in the future to cover part of the investments. Yeah, but those yeah. fellows, at least they told me that if this kind of uh, uh, sort of support, support would not have been there, there, there they would never have installed this uh, huge system. I don't know if that, that is correct. What's your view on this? Yeah, it was a mainly political decision because it's way easier to control one utility than it's, it's to control six utilities because political pressure is there and they I I'm not really sure if it's it has not it has if I can say it has nothing to do with customer, nothing to do with 
with water sector, it's just a political thing. Because still the fresh water side, it's, it's still with the utilities. They cannot get them together ever. Because the prices are going through the roof, because someone has to pay the investment, and it's, it's not affecting in my point of view, in, in all the aspects. These are just some ideas about this topic, which I believe is one, one solution if, if, if we, mm -hmm. in the beginning, if, if we want to think we have some problems in water sector in Finland, one thing is we are lacking leadership, and that's a hard thing, because nowadays politicians are starting to take more control of these utilities. Some, one of my colleagues said, but there's no problem in the water sector in Finland because we have management in control. I think management doesn't matter, leadership is what matters, because everything is about people. This is something about my past. I was in Yalasjärvi utility as a utility manager, and after that we made it to a limited company, and then I came here. About, well, these are the large water cooperatives in Finland. I have this map which I made sometime when I made my master's thesis, but as you can see, these large water, water cooperatives are mainly here in our northern region. Mainly because the thing was that the problems with water services first rose in the municipal centers. But the, as yeah, I think it's, it's a global thing that the politics is polarized more to the areas where not that many people live. So, they have this idea, the people living in the center, let's just let them take care of their own problems. And that's why we have these limited companies, cooperatives and stuff like that, because the municipality didn't want to fund these projects. But, this is a different story. Mm, these are some numbers from us. But about my idea, this is one thing. We had a staff of six people, ten years back now there's 14 of us. 13 who are full-time employees. So, what did we need to do? We needed to build an organization, and this is the thing where I got my ideas, and now I've been trying to look around, and this is... So, what, why leadership? Why do we need something about leadership, and what is it? What does it mean for this culture? Governance is action of manner of governing, management is process of dealing with, and leadership is leading a group of people and organization. This is really important. And what does this mean? It means motivating, it's getting people to pull, pull to the same direction. This is one of the best, how it's defined, be, to lead, be about, or means to access to, a, access to a particular place or in a particular direction. This is, we, when we get this organization working flexibly, good, that's, that's when magic starts to happen. But what we are discussing in this, Business, we are talking about tangible and intangible value producing assets, which means pipes, pumps, and valves, and the technology involved in them. But it has no intrinsic value. No pipe has an intrinsic value. It's about organization, it's about people, it's about we have to have our culture, mission, vision, values, strategy together. We really need to focus on values and mission. Why we exist. How do we get there? And how do we behave? How do we work? These are the things we are not hearing very much about because we have engineers, mainly engineers in the area, people who were born in a different kind of world, but now the generation is going because younger people, they need to be led. They need to have a direction. They need to know how to behave. That goes for all organizations and that requires openness, that requires Everything we are not in large picture doing at the moment, but that's what we here been trying to build, and we, I myself have been trying to make this value-oriented organization, which is heavily relied on its culture, to make the direction where we are going and make the magic happen. This is important question. What's the sole purpose of water service? What do we do? I would like to argue that we provide life in the area we are operating. If you ask this about people, they start talking about prices and quality services and stuff like that. These are just means to get to the mission, but this is our mission. This is the direction that we need.
it. Would you would you uh, say uh, would you agree on the concept of well-being? Of course, it's everything is related to that. Mm. This is this is the mission which is <laughs> many times it's falsely interpreted. I would like to argue the price and quality and stuff like that comes after this. And to get there, we need values. Our values are openness, honesty, and uh, sorry, I haven't been doing this in English, but openness, honesty, and uh, trust. And on top of that, it's an uh, individual responsibility that this happens. These are our values that made our organizational culture, which through when we act, we reach our goal, which is to provide living conditions in this area when working. I want to argue more about the importance of people, about people's well-being, about the thing that people, how they see their place in the world through the job they are doing. And with this, there's this concept of organizational smartness and organizational health. Organizational smart is about technology, finance, and marketing, and stuff like that, which needs to be there. It has to be there so we can do our business, but organizational health, it means minimal confusion, minimal politics, openness, equality, and these things which they both are needed so we can provide the most out of the company to the owners, to the customers, to the region where we operate. And this requires leadership. This is which needs to be put more to this to this business because in Finland they have this uh, discussion going on about the structural change of water industry. Someone has been arguing that we need only one water utility and then magic happens and everything's better. It doesn't because if you look at if you look at this picture, these are all of these are separate utilities which do their thinking. They solve their problems by themselves and if you think about this as a systemic whole there's always friction between the two parts of the system and then that's where the learning happens and that that's the thing that i really want to believe in if we only have one gigantic organization that has only one direction i i'd really say that that's a risk to our national national safety and everything I was only thinking yesterday evening, all of the sudden I, it came to my mind that maybe there has been some sort of language error when they speak about Rakennemut, structural change. Maybe we should, instead of listening to you, we should uh, <coughs> speak about Asennemut, change of attitudes. Change of culture and... Or, 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 or culture, yes. It's a, yeah. That would this probably be thing, more, more correct. But this is this is this is really hard for engineer background and people to understand because you cannot put this to numbers. You cannot give a value to organizational health. You cannot put value to the to everyone who opens the door to the workplace, how they feel there, and what does that give to the workplace in the long run. But about the organizational health and the things that need to be done. This is one thing if you know about the, this thing called a, how, it's, how is it in English? It's a autobus theory about the how should I approach this? Some kind of human needs. Yeah, but how do you know? How do you say? Do you know this? guy who has written this book, this drive, this Daniel H. Pink, about this uh, motivation, how do we motivate, how do we get motivated, what do we get out of the people when, when we only satisfy the basic needs and what do we get out of the people when they feel they are belonging to some group or get uh, positive feedback about their doing and positive doing. This is the thing. People have been arguing that 80% of people's potential are lost if all the basic needs are met. This so is a really big thing, think about it. It's a in the industry, water industry in Finland, 400 million euros, if it's 20%. No. So now you have That's a lot. very close to my favorite uh, topic is then the, the economic 
of scale, meaning then the economy of scale that small organizations are, are efficient. It's not about the size, it's about how do we understand what yeah. we've been doing, do we have a direction, do we have the culture values and stuff? The, the, is it like this or is it like this? Yeah. Who yeah. wants to work in a place like this? Yeah. Or rather, in a place like this? Nice focus. Um, okay, about the motivation. This is really interesting thing. If you think about organizations, how do we meet the basic needs? People need to think that they are getting fair income, they are getting fair wage, they are getting fair compensation about their lost time when they go to work. It's proportional, it's subjective, and it's a matter of organization to define it and choose right people who want to believe to the same values that the organization promotes. But about the driving forces, about how you motivate people, because money does not motivate anyone. Everyone can think about, think about your playing soccer. Or football, as, as you might say, you are not getting paid of it, but you want to do it because the doing itself is is price for something. But the three drivers, ultimate mastery purpose. Okay, the purpose it's it's something that the work you're doing has a meaning. In water sector, that should be easy. That should be easy. Okay, you're providing living conditions for the people. Ultimately, this is one thing which is he most heavily related to the culture, how do you lead people, how do you tell them what to do. But this mastery, this is really interesting in, in, in water works because this is really technical technical area of work. The mastery, because people really like to be good what they're doing, whether they're working on a niche or working on the, on the water works or here at the office, because this is really complicated technically. If you think about it as a whole, we have a lot of pipes, we have a lot of risks, we have chemistry, physics, money involved, everything. And this is when you get better at something that it has been researched that that produces flow. You know what flow means? Have you read this uh, Mihaly Six and Mihaly's book, The Flow, or stuff like that? When, when it feels like things just happen and you really like what you're doing, you get there's timelessness, effortlessness, richness, richness and selflessness involved. This is through which you get these flow experiences and things just start to happen. If you ever experience flow as I do many times, you know what I'm talking about. But this ultimately, this is important that you can, really because people are not dumb. People make really hard decisions in their personal, individual lives. They decide whether we get babies or not, whether we buy a new car or house, whether we want to live here or there or stuff like that. Where does that, where does that go when people open the door to the world? I believe that nowhere. We just have to get it out of people. We have to give them ability to make the decisions about their own work. This is really important. It, this is, and, but this requires openness from the organization. This requires bottom-up leadership and everything. Right. So here again, I will go back to the small organization. I think it is easier there are better person in the smaller organizations to achieve this. Maybe so, or maybe it's a, because you don't have that large organization, um, you have to. Yeah. You have to. Have yeah. And that okay. comes, and that, that's where you're right. But this is one thing, what we are talking about is, this is really related to the brand or image of water sector. This is how multiple large water utilities in Finland define their purpose. Our main goal is to achieve the minimum requirements that are defined by health and safety legislation. Who, mo who is motivated by this? No one is motivated by this. We should be talking Have about... Have you taken this from, uh, from the certain utility pages? Or? Yes, from the web pages. And this is... I would be surprised how, how often this happens. We want to build Finland to country which could export water services, which would be the tip of the spear in the world's water service thing. And this is what we say to public, to our customers. Well, well back to this, but well, this is something about happiness. How our year looks when, when we hate our job, you know, only good day is Saturday, and then there's summer holiday. If your year looks like this, it's not very nice. Why couldn't it be like this? Plus 80% efficiency. Well, 
this is one thing which we are experiencing in all the levels of society. This is from one of my friends. If you look at this, this, this if you really think about this, this really has a meaning. This is not my own idea, I've heard it. But if you think that the third generation problems can it cannot be solved using second generation technology by first generation people. I really want to believe that they... I feel guilty when I'm listening to this. <laughs> Don't feel touch. And this is why we have to listen to people, we have to trust people, we have to get the ideas out of people, but people don't give you their ideas if, you, if they are not motivated. Yeah. If yeah. only the basic needs are met, no one wants to give anything. Yeah. Yeah. And this is so, what we've been doing, what we have started to do for our own development, we participate in this great place to work, thing which measures the important things in, in organization about the culture trust. This is an escala de lugares donde es mejor para trabajar. Yo sé por qué ella. Ella es todavía gerente de She's the manager of eh, River Basin Committees in the state in the climate and water asian <coughs> of her state and probably what sería el qué puntaje te, tú, tú crees que ganaría PAC en términos de eh, ves mejor lugar para trabajar qué, qué, qué porcentaje tendría si le hiciera una si a la PAC le hiciera un estudio de donde la gente está feliz de trabajar De 0 a 100% donde estaría. Bueno. But this is a questionnaire. This is a multinational, international organization. This great place to work, and it it measures the things that are harder to measure by by traditionally, which are not that much taken care of. It about the trust in organization about. Uh, two-way information sharing about equality, about the group feeling and stuff like that. So we started. We have. We are in this for at least three years. We started last year, and we got a score of 78 percent. And um, we are just beginning our work to develop the organization, to develop the culture. Because the thing is that the vision of a manager. And the reality of an organization, they many times they are like this, but they should be more or less like this. And now I think that people are slowly starting to think that I am not talking bullshit, but they are starting to understand that there's something in this because all the time I want to promote our values that everything, the decisions made are based on these. But the average score of Finnish working life in this Research is 58%. 58%. If you think about how many companies there are with 35%, and the best companies in the world and in Finland have like 98% in, in this, how people feel their workplace. This is, this is something we want to be a bad. part of. And we, I would be really interested to see other water utilities coming into this, but this is, this is the, the thing that you really have to open hard questions inside the workplace and be willing to do work. Are there other uh, Finnish water companies mm -hmm. involved in this project? No, not that I know of, but they can't tell if the one who participates gives a permission to tell. But think about it, if you get 40%, you don't want everyone to know that you are in the 40%. We got the certificate now, and we are going to be even better next year and year after that, and try to try to really build the the best place to work in the world someday. It might be, but because why have we not been doing this inside this business? We don't have financial, how do you say, must to um, change our operation to survive. Financial incentive. We don't have financial incentive to survive yeah. in the market. We are monopoly. Yeah. But through risk management and through that, we have, we tell people what 
uh, extra value we are providing them, I see that this is the thing that we should be looking at to, to get for at least our point of view, because we are cooperative, we are owned by our customers, they have to give us a permission to exist. And we have to tell them that you have to do it. Do, do you look at look, look at what we are doing. Is this okay? Well, how we measure it? I'm not sure, but we have this general meeting in next Thursday, and out of our three three point three thousand three hundred owners, there's going to be ten present. So maybe we are doing something right because people are not that interested. If there are examples, if something is going wrong, yeah. then there will be then that's a rush of attendance. People. But okay, this is about the work in the organization that I'm trying, trying to at least start, but I think we're getting somewhere with this. And that's about it. Discussion? Yoni. Unfortunately, I wish... Uh, what is the, if any, the participation of the cooperative in the river basin associations or whatever, and what is the importance you give to it? We are members, uh, but the river basin association does not have very much power. It it makes uh, it's more of an environmental thing. They do some environmental projects. Uh, they have been renovating the rapids in this river and trying to promote sanitation projects or, or things like that, but it's, it's not very visible. Do they make any water quality testing in the river and analyze the water no, quality? No, they don't not have here. laboratory here. No, here. no, they don't have that. But there's this another kind of association which is more regional that provides consultant services from you know Mangala basis, the not for profit basis. They've been um, taking care of our because we have to take samples from wastewater and fresh water about this um Gagil Further than in, in about well asking offers from public, public tendering from providers public tendering, yeah. about the services and helping doing some consultancy work for water utilities. But that's a different, it's, a, it's more of a regional. But we have those basin-wide associations also, but they are not very visible, at least in this part of Finland. They have what Pekka has been mentioned earlier, this KVVI. They, it's large, large not-for-profit. Well, at least it used to be not for profit, but now they have to make it a limited company so that they can do their services that they've been doing for 60 years, and now they have to establish a company. It's KVVI yeah. Research Limited. Yeah. No tienen mucho poder aquí las agencias de But uh, as you said, they are uh, they are maybe the big ones are uh, concentrating on water quality. Control and, and, and environmental awareness, so they have uh, very little to do with the with the with the activities of water utilities as such. It's more or less the regional environmental authorities mm. who are participating in that discussion. And following the question of the basins, I, I am curious because obviously the Water Framework Directive. Uh, in many ways, it is a, a landmark, whether we like it or not, or we agree with everything. But there is one thing that River Basin, whatever agencies, committees have been asked to do, and this in countries like Brazil was also adopted, is to charge for water. A controversial thing in, in many ways, in political terms, I mean, charge for water, to charge for water. That's one of the imperatives of the Water Framework Directive. That supposedly in the EU, yeah. that supposedly all countries should implement. And normally, river basin committees or agencies are in charge of doing that. That would be very contradictory in our country anyway. 
things uh, in, in, in most of the European countries. Uh, most of the Typically, then the local authorities are by legislation in charge of water waste water services. And uh, on the other hand, there is that the tariff should cover the expenses. To my, to my no, but the, the question is, uh, just to give the example, in the UK they will say, well, we are doing it anyway. Yeah, because yeah. Because the climate emergency has yeah. oh, been in charge of levying you know, uh, some fees for the use of water. And the policy, we, are, we have been already doing it. We didn't need the water framework directive, we were doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also charging for the right to put wastewater treated back into the environment. So there are charges both for abstraction and for sending but water that, back to the environment. In the Nordic countries, no. And this is what the water framework directive uh, supposedly implemented. So in countries like Brazil, precisely the river water agencies are in charge of implementing the charging for water, which is very controversial, but it's happening in some places. It's happening. I, I have also a theoretical uh, question about that, and which is, and what do you charge? What do you charge? Oh, yeah. For one, for one cubic meter of water. No, no. This is what you charge to your customers, but yeah. who you get the right to abstract water from? From Here. the state. From the state. We have to apply for the right to abstract water. And the staff charges you what? For a Nothing. Fraction? Nothing. Nothing. Well, that's, Nothing the, that's the question. Supposedly, this should be taking place. Uh, abstraction should be charged. And of course, throwing back into the environment water supposedly so should be charged. Should be charged. Yeah, like, I, I, I guess where well, go, yeah. And this is in, in Brazil, they are forced to do that by law now. Yeah. And she, <laughs> she has been, and this is the nightmare because but, but the other question, I have a more theoretical question, but probably so if I, if is I, if I, if how what do you charge actually? Because okay. Water has to be abstracted. So, if, if I go back to that, that, in Finland there is no discussion. So, about, no discussion. No, okay. But in Lithuania they have, a, I don't know whether, I guess it is a Soviet tradition that then the water companies, water utilities, they have to, or anyone who draws water, have to pay per cubic meter something. Groundwater is a certain price, surface water is another price. When any whether it is a industry or a wastewater treatment plant owned by the municipality, these charges, wastewater to the water person, have to pay depending if there is a certain value for phosphorus, nitrogen, whatever, they have to pay even if everything is within the, within the limits. And if they exceed the limits, then they have to pay some five times more per ton than the standard fee. So I don't know, maybe Estonia or Latvia, they have said the same, at least in Lithuania, they have, a, I guess it's something tradition from the Soviet. Yeah, in the UK, there is a fee for abstraction, there is also for the right to discharge, to discharge. and also there are penalties. Yeah. But this is, this is really interesting because uh, if you think about this river valley, if you think about our discharge to the river, it's roughly, well, agriculture discharges, you know, dispersed pollution, it's how much? 20 times more. It's 80% of the nutrients going to the river comes from agriculture. And I think 15% from nature. And I think it's like two or three percent from our waste from the treatment plant. So it would be really interesting. How do you judge those? Aquino and Carlos for abstraction in terms of water. Well, that, that's the question because so, this is supposed to be a role of the river or whatever authority you create, according to everyone that discharges should be charged yeah. for discharging. Yeah. <laughs> the farmers, of course. 
So is it happening or not? Um, I can say the city of Paris is one of the worst hit by the European Commission fines because they are not complying, many years they do not comply with the requirements and they are charged to treat the wastewater up to... Yes, up to they are charged up fines. Up. Take water in the UK is the worst. Mm -hmm. And it's they every can't... year it's in, the, it's in the news for that. But that's in addition to having to, to have a permit for, for this mm -hmm. job. And in Brazil this is a nightmare, of course, because in some cases in the case of farmers or industries, you would say, well, it makes sense because water is coming into the production process and there will be a commodity at the end that will produce a profit. Yeah. And water is taken for free. Yeah. And actually, actually, but in the case of you providing a service for life, as, yeah. as you put it, it creates a potential contradiction. Because you have a human right to water to comply with. And actually, if you think about the secondary way, we are paying for it because in, in Finland, many many businesses have to have an environmental permit, uh -huh. which, which is which includes is, uh, the water. Uh, what? Includes the water. Uh, yes, uh, we have to have the permission to pump the water out of the ground, yeah. but that's not uh, it's not controlled that much. We give the readings once per year to the authorities, and then they charge us for reading the what we sent. So in a way, they are charging about it. But it, the money is not earmarked to go for the good of the river basin, but still... It, it, it's a tax. It, yeah, it's, it's mainly a tax. If you, if, you know, we pay for uh, for a waste for the treatment plant, that because we have a consultant who takes uh, samples once per month and also takes the samples from the river once per month. And then they combine it once per year and then it goes to the environmental authorities who charge us 2,000 euros to read to combine the report. And there's also this, uh, in Finland, I'm, I'm not sure, do you know, but um, we have a lot of peat. Do you know what's peat? And it's, it's used for the energy production. They are also in the, in the surveillance of the river. They are with it. And, uh, there's this um, meat industry here, they are also uh, paying for the uh, authority. They take samples from them also. So in a way, we are not paying, but not, not straight based on the pollution we are producing. And of course the idea was these authorities charging to keep the health of the river. Yeah. Not to pump the money somewhere else, as you. From, it should not be a tax, but something that is going. From, going from historical perspective, I would argue that one of the best legislations that we have introduced in this country was the 1974 Wastewater Fee Act. One of the worst. One of the best. Yeah. Because because. The first version you are talking about. Well, no, I mean, if you, if you, if you really look to, on the conditions that what our lakes and rivers were before that, that we had to do something with our wastewater, so there was no other source than just uh, getting from the consumers, and the prices were more than doubled 1st of January 1974, and at least in the professional magazines and even other magazines or, or, or what I have been able to read, I, I have not seen any cr critical writings towards that, because everybody understood that we have to do it anyway. Yeah, but if you remember the first version of the law had a flaw in it. The legislation said that the only authority that can charge for wastewater was municipality. But we had a lot of private companies producing these services in Finland, but the legislation didn't <laughs> actually ah. give them power to charge. They changed it after one year. Okay. But still okay. there was a okay. kind of big flaw if you think about it. If, if we would have been doing wastewater, we wouldn't have legal right to charge. Ah, yeah, 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 okay, okay, but okay. Then they well, noticed their flaw and changed it. Yeah, 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 that's right. It was even, uh, wasn't it, uh, in the first person, it was called something like, where the only the municipality was pointed out, or was it? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. Yes. The 74 version, and then they changed it. Yeah, 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 correct. If I remember correctly. Yeah, but well, well, it's a minor thing anyway. I mean. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. But that's an important legislation. Of course, of course. I think this the, the, this question is very important because thinking about futures, and that they work a lot on. I don't think it's about the future. It's about the present. Uh, some people rightly criticize these moves, like the Water Framework Direct yeah. Development and, and previously even the Dublin Principles, as a move towards privatization of water resources, which is partly true, but not necessarily true. So this is where it becomes a... a and it has a direct impact on what you do. Not now, but it may come. The future is here sometimes. That's the trend. In a sense, you recognize the importance of having someone taking care of the health of the basin or whatever you want to work, the, the ecological system, if you wish. You cannot do that. At least you can do it in your place, but you, you cannot do it. Someone should be doing that. That's the, the idea. But obviously, the sham from that to commercialization of water it's not far, it can be easily done, and in some cases it has been intended. Chile is one case, um, and there are other cases. And I understand that in Europe that was the idea. I think it has not succeeded, but I think, uh, and they will try again and again until they get it. But the I thing is, if you compare the countries in Europe, if you think about the northern countries, the Scandinavia and Finland, we were, in a sense, we were coming behind the more developed countries with the centralized services. And if you think about, for example, Ireland, which has no meter of water, it's the same price for everyone, whether you, well, whether you use 10 cubic meters of water or 100. Well, Ireland. They tried they have been introduced a year Did they? Yeah, yeah they yeah. tried it five years back and it didn't yeah. go through and now yeah. they introduced it. Yeah. And the thing is that if, if you think about what's the history of services, it's the same thing with China, you know? They've seen the mistakes that all the other more developed countries have made in the past and they are not going to repeat those. Yeah. It's, it was the same thing with Finland and our economic growth in 70s and 80s. We didn't repeat the mistakes made by some older countries. That's always who comes after, gets all the benefit what other else have done. If you look yes, at the some, well, there's sometimes some advantage to utilize these sunnister and bedhouse. <laughs> but somehow then this water framework directive and river management on river basin basis, I think in Finland that is, I don't know whether we have made some theoretical river basins, but really, this water framework directly that way, that then real river basin management is organized. So yeah, nothing like that, that there would be kind of national-wide river basin management here. No, there. maybe on paper. That I understand, and this is why I want to have a conversation yeah. about that, because it's important. But apart from the river basin model, that yeah. we know French and Spanish, and, and got, but the principle that you should charge for water okay. was adopted by the UN in, in the Dublin Principles and it, it became part of Agenda mm. 21 and is now in everywhere. You mm. have to charge for water. Yeah. And some people say, well, that's privatization. Others will say, no, not necessarily. Yeah. Because charging for the extraction of water can be a way of protecting endangered aquifers or rivers. Um, and there are many anecdotes from the UK that I know. Um, and the other way around, charging for discharging uh, and penalizing people, etc., is a way also of protecting the, the sources. It's not necessarily commercialization. So I think this is coming. Maybe in Finland didn't yet make an impact, whether it's a river racing or not. But I think it will come. It's, it's coming. It's being forced in one way or another to countries. They don't, don't they don't comply. The Spanish have an old saying from the colonies is I obey but do not comply. <laughs> Which means 
formally I sign, in practice I don't do back, it. Back to, the, back to the Dublin principles, of course, water is an economic good, but it is un, it is complete misunderstanding if we are arguing that 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 economic is a, a water is an economic good and nothing else, like some some yes. bodies did it. Yeah. But even if you do that, as I have done that criticism, uh, you may have to recognize that it makes sense, it's, it's, it's making sense in some case to protect aquifers or where it has to be protected for, from people just abstracting without any control. And in some cases, even public companies do that, not necessarily industries or even public utilities may do it or do it. I so this was the concern, one of the concerns. And this is, I take this because it wasn't clear, and and the point I was, I, I wrote an article about this. What are the rationals if you were, if the authority will charge you for water? If, if an authority here, and you should be part of the discussion because you are probably one of the main abstractors. Mm -hmm. uh, what they will charge you for? Yeah. How you estimate the value of whatever volume of water you abstract? Yeah. <laughs> is it different from the abstraction in Tampere? So there is no... UNESCO has a whole team working on this. For over a decade they have been producing papers of this, about the value of water. What is the value of water? Where does it come from? <laughs> and they have a black box that they call intrinsic value, <laughs> which means anything, yeah. <laughs> because they cannot put, as you say before, a dollar sign to it. But I think the relevance of this, I think, is uh, because you say at some point, we don't want less politics as possible. I understand what you mean. Yeah, inside organization, it yeah. depends on the... But this is very political. What yeah. you say there is very political. I was thinking about her because, as a manager, she, she was dismayed about the quality of the work environment. It's this now in her organization, and no one knows what to do about it. It's about people. Um, so you're right, but this is highly political. Changing the attitude towards how we run water utilities, for what, what is the mission? That's political. Yeah, the second yeah. thing the mission of a water utility is not to produce profit for I, individual. I was I was just I was just thinking that what you actually your your meant because you say I know I can't even do you refer to the party politics and, and avoiding the party politics? Yes. I'm talking about the politics inside organization about how we how our social network inside the organization goes. If there's a lot of politics involved, which does not make sense any, anything about why you should you, you be doing something like that. It's about trust to the people, the people yeah. who are doing the work get to decide how they do it. And that's a, the most important question inside organization, because managers cannot decide in, in the last sense how you do your work. There's no tailors, it doesn't work anymore yeah, in the 2020s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot divide anyone's job here in this organization to manageable pieces that can yeah, be yeah, yeah. told exactly how you do it. People have to be using their own brain. And that's minimal politics for me inside an organization. Mm -hmm. It's not about this strict structure that you have to get permission to do something really dismal from five steps above you. When even we don't have the five steps above anyone, but still, yeah. you know, people should be able to decide. It. But that this is not the thing. For example, in public sector in Finland, you have, and I suppose, say in Argentina, you have ten bosses above you who don't have their skin in the game on the work you're doing, on the decisions you're making. They only they get the profit, but not the other side. If something goes wrong, they just say, "Oh, that's not." But from our point of view, for it, we could call you your mother, if you wish, uh, the politics of autonomy. Politics of autonomy, that's interesting. Yeah, that's or, not, yeah. or the politics of empowerment. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good, yeah, that's uh, a good uh, word. In the sense of having an organization where 
things are less vertical, less top down, yeah. and more, more fluid, more, more organic. Mm -hmm. That's it. And no, it's fantastic. Maybe, as he says, it's easier if you have 12 people or 14, then you have 2,000 or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not just about numbers, I agree with that. Yeah, it's not just, it's, uh, but it, that's true that larger organizations, of course, they are more complex. It's, it's more, more complicated. Complex. But if you look at the things that people like Richard Branson, Google, every these new companies or traditional companies who are who are really doing good in that great place to work in, what they've been doing, what they've been giving to their employees, it's a... It's a different thing, but that requires leadership. You have to make the limits, you have to point the direction people are going, people want to be led. People want that you give them a direction and then after they go that way, you ask them, how did you do? How did you make your goals? How did you manage? And they are happy when they can decide themselves how to work, how to reach a goal. Yeah. But there is some, something I picked up in his book. I just wrote a review. And she mentioned, uh, when we entered here <laughs> earlier, she said, Elder should be here. Elder is a Brazilian guy who is the, he was the Madison engineer, who was the manager of, he actually developed a new system in the north of Brazil for scattered communities. It's called the Integrated Rural Sanitation System, CISAR. And he's a champion, that's the other way he uses the word champion, a leader. He's a real leader himself. He's mad. He drives a truck every day from one point to the other of the state in the same area. But he picked it up in his book, and, and Elder has recognized it in, in a project. He's a champion, but he goes, he actually retired now, and he comes. Who comes after him? If, if you put it down to leadership, and it's not that leadership is not important, it's very important. But, or championship, you need champions. He got that in the, in the book about cooperatives, particularly in the past, they needed champions. That's something that happened particularly with these um, voluntary organizations. And when the champion gets sick or retires yeah. or whatever... Yeah, you might be lost. Yeah. It might be, but you, that, that's the main thing that the one who leads has to do. He has to create passion for the mutual goal, for the organizational goal. And that's why we need the culture, we need values, that people believe that the good of the organization comes back to them when they go together towards the goal. And that's the thing. Someone has to start it. I'm not arguing that, but after that, after, after you switch, if you have a strong organization which has implemented it, its values, its culture, the way the organization works, then the switch is easier. You can get a new guy to make a new direction. But the thing is that before he knows the organization good enough, he has to have he has to know what what's been done before so he can make his own assumptions and create the new direction. And that's the thing. The role of champions, it's, it's, of course, it's, it's really big, but if we don't have these leadership structures, organizational culture, values, clear mission, stuff like that, the one who, after the champion is gone, the one who comes next is like, hey, what is this? This is just a group of people going dispersely in all the directions all the time, not doing anything, <laughs> anything important. That's the thing. That's why we need this. It's, if you think about this organization, which is owned by the customers, this is their property. This is individual property of the people living in this area. We have to do it for them. Yeah. And that, that's why value-based leadership in our organization, in my opinion at least, really should work. And it should work in all water utilities. Because this is, a, as, as one of my colleagues said, the utility, we aim to the infinity. We aim that we are being here as long as there's people. We borrow water from the nature and then we have to return it there at least in the same condition that we took it out of there. That's the thing. And these are really, how do you say, idealistic values, but still they're true. And we should be promoting them. Not about the, not the discussion about who has the cheapest water. 
Yeah, and most yeah. pipes. Yeah, <laughs> which is ridiculous. <laughs> it is really. Although I have to say that we have the fifth cheapest price in Finland, <laughs> and still yeah. we are making. And this is one thing about cooperatives, which I hear a lot, which I always have to be reminding of, because I like to remind about it. Because people say, okay, you're a cooperative, you're not trying to generate profit. But of course we are. We are trying to maximize the profit we are generating, but it just goes back to customers as cheaper and better service. Not like in, in bigger cities that it goes through hidden taxation to something else. It might be. Hmm. But that's one thing, one, one of the things you said before, which is really, really, really interesting question, that why we are charging water, who we are charging from the water, that, that's used because are we charging the one who's benefiting from the service? Not all the time so, because a lot of people who live around here, they benefit that we have this water utility here, which provides means for business, agriculture, stuff like that, but they're not paying about the service. This is really interesting question about the, is the beneficiary and the one who's paying the costs the same, same person? Because legislation in Finland starts from there that the one who benefits pays the cost, but that's not so. That, that, that's really, really complex and really large question which should be discussed more in... But people just want to uh, reduce the question to the simpler solution because mm. it's easier to find, because the real solution is, is really hard to find. Who is the owner of uh, actually the water cooperates all the meter, but basically the sort of uh, who is the owner of the meter? <laughs> He I like to think that customer customers pay the bill and we just generate the profit for those others who are using yeah. the service. It's, it's like a, our gift to the other societies around us. So. This is the second I mean when the, it's coming. This is the where the system goes. So it's, it's very complex because rationalizing the use of water and how we treat water as a natural good, etc., is inevitable because rationalization is a process that goes backwards and forwards but overall it goes forwards so that's one thing your ideas which i shared go against the tide and this is where again the politics comes to you are doing politics by defending this model and this model goes against the tide <laughs> <laughs> and therefore you have to be aware that there will be conflicts or there are already conflicts because a model that does not put profit as the main goal whether it is private or public has to be profit that's the mainstream thing that we got in the world, in Europe, everywhere doing something else is going against the tide Maybe you are in a corner of Finland, if you allow me, and for yeah. the time being you manage to say, yeah. well, look at me, <laughs> but they are coming for you, in a sense. <laughs> and luckily the tide also goes and comes, it's an, uh, <laughs> but um, this is a problem. So there are several processes. We have to agree that maybe you have low population in Finland, so that helps but they are going to live in cities more and more and more. That has consequences, of course. Then you have uses of water. You are charging everyone the same. In principle, this is unfair. That's against your principle. Mm -hmm. That's unfair. how you put it. That, that, that's, <laughs> that also is a really, really, really interesting <laughs> question, but the debate, it's also reduced to the how much pipe do you have per person he should pay more. But why? Is, is it more unfair than the model in Israel? No, but I was thinking. But that's really. I was not thinking of domestic users. I did. Ah. I was thinking, if the guy that makes beer, <coughs> yeah. and then the water becomes a commodity, or makes whatever else, is paying the same amount, uh, in a sense, than the poor family that has two children and have. That's the, the unfairness. That, in theory, they have been trying to correct. I, I would agree that water, we wrote that in the Declaration of New Water Culture mm -hmm. back in 2005. One thing is water for life, and another is 
what uh, for citizenship, remember, I, I didn't agree again, but we signed it anyway. Water for citizenship, that means that everyone should have 100 liters per day. Okay, that's a right of citizenship, but it doesn't need to be free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then someone wants to have a golf course around here, fine. If it is, but the water for that cannot be at the same price. But and then water for business, fine if there is an agreement. But much less so. That should be charged at a different. So obviously it, it, it creates problems for a in, cooperative. This is interesting. In fact, there was one detail that uh, uh, in earlier times uh, municipalities had the sort of policy that they encouraged industries to become to their areas, and one trick was to give their uh, lower price for the world cheaper if like in city of Porto, it, it was just simply how big was your how many cubic meters you used your, the more you used the cheaper per cubic meter. yeah so there was some sort of re, re, relative reduction in water price we have that still you have that yeah we have a lot of agri agriculture but the growth it's not that big but if you use for uh, the first step comes if you use more than 10,000 cubic meters well, you really have to have a lot of cows to use that much, so yeah. practically not very many people get it. And yeah. it, it doesn't matter because we have water, and if you think about it, if you think, of, think about our business as a whole, uh, about the cost affected cost principle, the costs affected by someone who uses more water in one spot, he doesn't produce that much costs as the dis more dispersed usage and he might be using a thousand times more than a normal household so in some sense that's also yeah, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 In, in, in our, our case it's not that much if you think about the normal customer pays for fresh water 65 cents per cubic meter and the one who uses 10,000 cubic meters or more pays 59 so the growth is not that big. No. Yeah, yeah, no, no, small no. I was it's, not it's, thinking about the specific. Yeah, yeah, about the principle. <laughs> yeah. 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 But then, about then, of course, it depends how water services are organized. Mm -hmm. So that in uh, Finland, then, of course, there are examples like the cooperative typically own utilities owned by the municipalities. So municipalities, they try to get the beer company. And then the benefit, they charge the same. But, but on the other hand, they get the industry, it is a good taxpayer, municipality can get tax, so it can, with the tax income, support the not so wealthy families. Yeah, yeah. So that way it is compensated at least. In, but of course, if it is a private water company, it's a different case. But in case of Finland and many, many other countries where it's municipalities are in charge of what I think it, it balances it. But the problem with that is that the money is not earmarked. It's not earmarked to this. But it, it should be at this uh, openness about where the money is put. In in some sense they could ha have some of that, but still it, it's still because I think that on the other hand things should be made si as simple as possible yeah. so that as many customers or users can understand why we are doing things that mm -hmm. we have this some common sense on the things we are making if you look at many things when there's some really strict rule which is made and then there's something that does not comply to that rule then you should be able flexibly to because people are not they are not evil they are not they are not uh, you know assholes by nature as you might put it because when you can explain something that makes common sense people are usually very ready to accept that and yeah. they are also very ready to accept that someone gets something more than i do when you are you know openly told why this is so and it's made clear why, why we are doing this for example what we have in finland if you think about nuance here it's a we have this uh, when some household or some other building is connected to the water network, they have to pay this uh, connection, connection, fee. connection fee. 
which is usually based on the surface area of the building. So how does this work when you build a large grocery store which might have one bathroom and they pay like a lot more than they are, they are you know, stressing the network. And these are the things when, when it, they're really interesting discussion, then there comes politics. Why do they have to pay that much because they are not paying that much and this, because rules are quite hard. And I, I really think myself that simple rules are best because uh, it's not our main source of income from these fees. It's a different story in growing cities where they have to invest in new infrastructure. Uh, I get it, but, but in, in places like we, we can do it differently. We can think about things in a different point of view. But the thing is that we are trying to make, how do you say, Equality and equality of opportunities are not two same things, but they are usually falsely interpreted as mm -hmm. being. Because they want to make rules same for everyone, but as people, different utilities are different. The same, same rules don't apply that good in many places. And, and uh, if you look at this northern part of Finland, which has a tough winter, sweat of snow, few people, there's really innovative business ideas in many utilities, in, in many cases of which would never be allowed to be done in public utilities such as Tampere or places like those. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. I really want to see more of this customer perspective. Uh, this is, well, I, I think maybe I am curious, you know, maybe someone will do some PhD or masters about that, how the discussion in Finland uh, is taking place maybe at the academic level about these issues, about the flow of European initiatives like the Water Framework Directive or the UN and water law in Finland, water law and water practice. For instance, in terms of this, charging for water and the rest, I, I, I don't have any idea, I'm curious. But the other you mentioned now something that connects <coughs> something very important I wanted to ask. Because you say something like asking the users or the owners, because the users are owners in the cooperative. How is the participation arranged? For instance, do people participate? How tariffs are, are fixed? Are people do people participate in the discussion of what the tariff should be, how it should be charged, why, all that. Or this is just more run as a kind of technical matter among you and the staff. Uh, because that's again another principle of the European Water Directive, which has one thing which I value. It took many years to, to get there, and when it got there, had many chunks cut because the chemical companies didn't like, yeah. for instance, the rules that will come into force because they will have to make more stringent production processes to avoid pollution of rivers. So the chemical companies were responsible for delaying many elements of the directives and others so the, but in any case, it was a very participative thing. Communities in river basins participated, and that went into the Water Framework Directive. So there was a lot of civil society participation in discussing all these issues, which I don't think has happened anywhere else. I say in Latin America, we had a process like that in Latin America, that all the countries of Latin America come together and they get a common Latin American water law that at least says basic things. Then there is diversity, of course. But I think, how, does, how do people participate in Finland if they do at all? Because it's now understood that kind of, we got water democracy, water citizenship. I, just, I am reviewing an article that probably will be published. He talks about 
hydro citizenship. I think too much. I invented too many new concepts. But the idea is that how how is it happening? Well, they don't. That's <laughs> well, it's a simple answer. <laughs> that, that that's the same. It, it would be, but when you talk with people, they really value what we are doing. They really value. They they have this idea that okay, somehow what we are doing is good and it's really good quality and the price is good and we are doing good things when you talk with them but then about the, we have this one general meeting per year where we choose the board we have seven members in our board which about the pricing I'll come to that soon but the the thing is that maybe it's it's this thing that one guy told me when we have this fusion going on with the other company who was really negative about it and I asked him, well, this thing has been discussed in, in your general meeting for like three years. Why didn't you, why didn't you, you haven't, you have never been there, but now you're so negative. He said to me that, hey, I don't have to go to church every Sunday to believe in God. I was like, wow, wow, that's something really philosophical. It's, it's, well, the same principle It's here because when people feel that we are doing something good, that's when they take this passive approach while still valuing this. But this is one thing we are really starting to do in because we've been really busy. You don't have time for everything with small organization like this. But we really want to build a positive image of what we are doing to Even go to, more positive. To go to go social media, to go because we are one thing what I really think that we are not doing really good. It's somewhat related to that. What I showed. What's the mission of many, many, many water utilities in Finland? Is the thing that when we approach our customers or people living in the area, we what's the most common news? Well, that what's usually one hundred percent of news that the water utility comes out of is we have a leakage. We are fixing it. Water might be somewhat colored, but it's very, very safe to use. We are just telling the negative things. Mm. When yeah. we've been doing this for like 40 years, just yeah. telling negative things, what we've caused is that usually when we tell something, people think that, okay, there's a pipe burst. Yeah. <laughs> something yeah. 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 We, so, what we should be doing, we should be or doing water like, is shut off. Like, like nine positive things for yeah. the negative and what I think this has also caused is that we are discussing something about that okay we have this renovation debt which is something yeah. which is something I don't understand at all because it's mainly a political thing yeah. and things usually in Finland are really good the leakage percentages whether it's in the fresh water or waste water site they are really low compared to for example, Belgium or other Central European countries. And this is this positive image, brand building, image making. This is because it's really cheap. It just takes time and it takes something that you have a clear view of what you're doing. So, some companies are providing this because one thing about the information we are providing is it's really funny because for example, Tampere was they have this really, really, really nice web page which shows from some modeling software calculated what's the amount of chlorine in water, what's the temperature, what's the hardness of water. The utility has decided what customer wants to know, but no one is interested about the amount of chlorine in the water that yeah. they know. They are not interested about that. They are interested to hear adjectives that they have something which is best, something which is good, something which is it's like image thing. How do you provide the feeling for the customer that we I, have can, I can't I can't help commenting this. I recall a couple of years it was just particularly the annual report of Tampere Vote to my home city. And I almost got fed up with the when the, I noticed that the instead of starting the annual uh, annual uh, sort of uh, story or the was the, the, summary. Uh, the summary for the annual report, the managing director started to praise that how cheap our water is instead of starting that how good water we have. So he could have done it in in the in the completely opposite way, raise up the positive things 
then putting down the talents of uh, 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 ta talents of aging infrastructure and, and this debt of rehabilitation, and then in the end say that uh, by the way we do this all for quite a, for a fair, fair, fair price. But I, I think it was just completely misordered, and I'm afraid that this is not the only case. Yeah, you know about the same city. I met this politician, this green politician, this Orastin, in the ministry a few months ago. And he told what's the perspective of uh, municipality politics about water sector in Finland. And then he, he said that the most important thing for a customer is the cheap price. <laughs> you know, have you ever asked any customer what's the main thing you want from this service we are providing you 24 hours, 7 days a week, 365 days a year? I, I've asked many times, and no one has said to me that the most important thing yeah. is price. Yeah. No one. Well, then he commented to me, that's not true. I know better. <laughs> Thank you for this really he knows better this man nice discussion. discussion. <laughs> Interesting enough, they invited this similar politician to the workshop that was held yesterday in, in yeah. Helsinki. I don't know, did you participate in that? No, I wasn't there. I was supposed yeah. to go, but we had we have yeah. discussions yeah. going on here. I had so much work to do, I couldn't go, but I was in the first one. Yeah. But did you know that he also owns the consulting company which is running the project? No, oh, I didn't. It's Turks for Consulting who's doing it, and Oras Lincoln is an owner. Is it? Yeah. This is corruption. Well, <laughs> think about it. Well, isn't it? <laughs> well, isn't it? Well, because I, I wrote, when they, 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 when they sent this, uh, when they sent this uh, sort of questionnaire for that uh, project, and I read the uh, four words by Honorable Professor Riku Vahala, I couldn't help commenting that there is some Astia Maku here. Yeah. In other words, that uh, the, the, the sounds like uh, that you are, you are running a project and you have decided in advance your results and then you are trying to make some arguments uh, to support your, your basic ideas that you should have a bit different approach to this. But what's come with Osmo because he came out with the same ideas in the last uh, editorial well, that, that's what I was about. I, 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 I read it through and I was a bit surprised. Well, think about it. It's got a, quite a bit of controversy here in the field. Because what I, what at least I think, that the field field does not comply to those ideas. Mm -hmm. The utilities don't comply. Well, well that's, that's what I have. Uh, I have the impression as well after discussing quite, with quite many people. Yeah, and it's something. But these are <laughs> some well, of the I, 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 I think the, ho the whole concept of Russian and Mutus is a mistake. Well, what does it mean? What does it mean and where does it come from? Yeah, and is there It comes from all of a sudden by some, some external bodies. Maybe this or Astunkin and his company. And, yeah. and somehow it is, it is highly useless because in the health services there will be a big, big structural change. And uh, more or less all the experts who know what it is, they say that it will be a failure. And this is, this is shown as a model that because in health sector there will be structural say that's a good reason to make a structural change in water sector as well. And many people are trying to find analogies with the energy sector and that they have had this large structural change in Finland. The prices have more than tripled if you, if you compare it to the amount of investments made to infrastructure. And now they want to see that we should be doing the same. But yep. This is one thing that I've been saying many times that you have to, when we have this discussion, you have to remember that the water infrastructure is mainly private property. Our eastern neighbor tried socializing it, and everyone knows what happened with that. You know the Soviet Union when they socialize everything. But this is one thing because you cannot socialize private property. Then we can take all the shops and all the banks and everything, and be like Venezuela, and be really, really happy with our lives and stuff like that. So it's, that's the thing people don't understand because there are a lot of limited companies, cooperatives. Not everything is municipally owned. Mm. Only the biggest cities. Yeah. If you think about it. Which, which, which is in a way quite interesting because we have this sort of institutional diversity in terms of scale, in terms of other regions. I don't know if somebody is saying that there is a, we need some rock and mood, some structural change. So in fact, what is he or she out? Yeah. So what is this? 
And what, what is it? The why is it there? Why is this structural change? Everyone is talking about yeah. it's, it's just a bird. And I think yes. It's like it's and it has provided this <laughs> this atmosphere. It's it's like you know, sex with teenagers. Everyone is talking about it. Everyone thinks that everyone else knows what it is, and in fact, no one knows what it is. You get what I mean? Because there are yeah. these this factual yeah. problems with the. Yeah. It's, it's just. Fun. And no one has defined it to me. By the, way, try to by the way, Yoni, where are you in La Peranta? No, no, oh. I have a lot of work to do here. So, so I, could, uh, key, I could send you. Uh, the discussion with myself and Jarma and you could have your comments. We are going to publish it in Kunta Technik in the coming uh, in the next uh, next uh, uh, volume. We have two weeks uh, time to we consider whether we pick, uh, put it like uh, like our discussion was or would should we sort of uh, open it up. Now that I'm listening to you, I, we, it might be visible to to question in the end of the discussion more clearly that, okay, what is this Raken Mutus impact? What is it that it, it, it's all good for? Yeah. But uh, going back to your question, how do the people participate in the decision making or whatever? So I think what is rather typical in Finland, I guess, that they are like, so people are happy with the service, mm -hmm. They do not complain about the price, the quality of water is good, wastewater is going. So people rather spend their free time by, by being then the coaches or their children, football team or something. Then go to the, to the meeting and say somehow they feel it useless because why to go there because everything is okay. Yeah. This is no. This is very important. This is my area of research yeah. as well. The question is, uh, and, and you notice it when you are happy with the service, you, mm -hmm. you, and in many ways, this question of participation has a dark side. In, in Manchester University, they organized a seminar about participation, and they produced a book, and it's called "Participation: The New Tyranny." The new, the new children. Because they were by everyone now, you have to have participation, and it's a box to be ticked. Mm. Otherwise, you don't get loans. So it becomes. And for in the case of Latin American slums, you wonder why people, the poor, have to participate to get the service. Well, the middle class does, does not need yeah, to participate yeah. because, as you say, if the service is good, why you will pay the bill and that's it. So the, at that level it's understandable, and no question. When the service is good, it's well priced. But the question again becomes the political comes. I, I wrote about this because sometimes there are changes. Even in countries where water is very well run, historically. I mean, I go to the UK, I drink water with no, I don't ask, should this water be further filtered? No, yeah. I just drink it. Even in London, even it doesn't taste very well. I, I know it's safe. And it's privatized. I am against privatization. <laughs> and I drink it right? because I know that there is a control. So even, in, even under privatization, at least in the UK, you know that you can trust because someone is controlling that. Mm. And yet, you cannot fail to realize that it's a very opaque system. That water, whether it is very well managed or very badly managed, mm. is not transparent to the citizens. Mm. Citizens have almost no participation whatsoever at any level. Mm -hmm. The danger with that is that, of course, you may have a whole history of perfectly Democratic in another sense, like you provide good water at a fair price. You preserve, you have people like you preserving the well-being of the people. Fine. But people are completely unaware of how it is run, all what is involved, and what happens. Um, for in, a case from Barcelona. In Barcelona, the water company and many other companies in Catalonia have been private for over 100 years. Yeah, yeah. 
Now the people that are against the privatization because it's a French multinational mm. that got it uh, realized that common people didn't know that it was private. Yeah. Common people thought yeah, it was yeah. a public company. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now because there is a debate, they realize that it's private. Yeah. And actually that is a multinational. Uh, and yeah. that someone is making a lot of profit yeah. with it. And people do not agree with that now. But until now, people were misled mm -hmm. into saying that it was public. It's so easy to mislead people. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Even not trying to mislead them, but in terms yeah. of... So yeah. participation is a problem, even when things are well run. It doesn't mean that people should be having an opinion on everything else now. That's mm -hmm. stupid. But uh, how you democratize the management of things like water, not just the water service, of water in the, because who is the owner of the water? We should say, I guess in Finland the answer will be the people, as it should be. In Chile, it's not. In Chile they manage to give the rights to water to individuals and to private companies. We have in rivers the are owned by people okay. or private companies. Lakes, rivers. lakes, aquifers. In, in, in Finland, it's for quite a bit. I know that we're about to happen. So, and now they don't know how to change it. They don't know how to change it. And it was done after the dictatorship. The dictatorship set the basis, but it was done in democracy. <laughs> but you never got it going. So things can change so easily, and yeah, people I, don't know, don't have instruments I, I to bring politicians <clears throat> into account because they didn't know. You were doing it so well. In our Water Act, to my understanding, it has been always very clear, and it is with the current uh, uh, legislation as well, and it is also the principle of international law organization that. Uh, at this Helsinki Rules 1966, that was later modified to Berlin Rules 2004, that if we are using water, we have to have certain priorities. Mm -hmm. And this water for communities and people should have always the first priority. And this is very clearly also in our legislation, which is, I think it's very strong anyway. But now the first priority is with the environmental people, because the environmental, the environmental law is so forcing that it's actually really hard to get permission to pump, to use pump. Yeah, that's another story. Big, big cities are really struggling to feed their need for yeah. water because the getting to pollution to use the water because their natural values are so, they are first priority if there's some some plant or some so animal, if you think about at least for, oh, okay. there, there might be one problem then you have to do like And, and at, the, at the same time, like, like in Tampere region, they are, uh, they are still taking sand and gravel from the aquifers and even the environmental, so-called, what they are claiming to be, environmental, uh, uh, whatever they call it, the Kangasalan, nature conservation uh, people in Kangasala, uh, they seem to be worried that their esker uh, formation will be destroyed or which, be, which will be polluted if uh, artificial recharge will be used in the esker area. But nobody is worried about the fact that the, the, the sand and gravel is mined and taken there for good, which is uh, absolute stupidity from my point of view. Yeah, there's, there, there's no environment protection in their thinking in that sense. Yeah, it's when, when things start going the wrong way because then the when there's a group of people who get the when it starts rolling when the snowball effect comes then it's really as this, as you said about the Catalonia because people don't think as individuals people tend to think as if it's the common uh, common. Uh, opinion which is more valuable to us than our own individual opinion. And when, when people agree to something, they, they study it. If you, if you read any, any works about Daniel Kahneman or people 
psychologists who have made it very clear that people as individuals are usually quite intelligent, but as a group, the stupidity comes in. <laughs> So, so you refer to the what the Alasa, Alasuta, I can't remember this English name, but I refer it into, to my book that uh, if, you, if you look on this international policy, not only in water but basically anything, individual governments are arguing that we have now a new innovation, but they do not know, either they don't tell that this is actually a sort of thing which is happening worldwide. And to be modern, they behavior, we have to do this because the others are doing. So it, it is like a, it's like a group of fish that goes like that without any critics. Yeah. <laughs> but then there is about this participation in water corporate in Kusamo, which is the further northeast from here. So that there was, I understood it was then a question of wastewater treatment plant. So then the cooperative is in charge of wastewater. And there were two, I think, that uh, two options. And then the the manager was pushing forward one option. Then there was the annual meeting, and then the opponents they gathered because they used to be tempted to come into the meeting, mm. and to make a decision to buy. So the opponents they gathered a group of supporters. So they were twenty people. Five people, or it was like one car full of people. No. And, and, and this cooperative, it has an annual turnover of 5 million euros, which is supporting one ski center and 15,000 people, and it's really big. Then they fired. The meeting fired. The no, plan. no, the meeting didn't fire. The meeting just changed two, the, two members from five member board. And board? Then, yeah, then, yeah. then there was the third member who was in the, you know, on the edge. So mm -hmm. then she decided to follow the. The guys made the change and then they fired the CEO. Yes. Ah, was it recently? Oh, no, uh, not 20 years, maybe. Ah, 15. 15 years. Okay, I think it was in 2003. Okay. And then after that, people got active and there was a new meeting. Which new general was meeting. 600 people and they fired the whole board, increased the amount of members of the board to nine, so this couldn't happen again, and reappointed the CEO who just actually got retired. retired now, yeah. Yeah, but like... Where was it? It goes wrong. Okay, okay, part. okay, 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 all right. I'm sure but I think he retires day after tomorrow, oh. even on Friday. Yeah. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, the one who commented, or was supposed to comment your dissertation, uh, your thesis. He commented, yeah. Yeah, so this... Keio. Keio. Keio, Keio. Yeah. yeah, he got fired on the last CEO, before that he got fired also, but that was due to some, <laughs> some, not that... Guy yeah, was the other guess, yeah, I didn't know. So, okay, he's becoming retired now. Yeah, huh? so although he's only uh, 62. It's water. Yeah, the man. Water he had a good contract. But it's always... So it's, uh, very important. Well, this is something maybe for another meeting and maybe with, with you because we, we, the we have also a few kind of cooperatives. What is a cooperative? That's the other question now because yeah. I, I think this should, should be addressed in the dossier in the working paper. Because yeah. sometimes under the word cooperative we really have very different formats yeah. and with different consequences. And in this case, the people have the capacity to fire someone, to, mm -hmm. to fire the board, which is, but it's not always the case that you have the, the people, a kind of assembly, mm -hmm powers to, to, to do that. In some cases, there is an, in, an interesting article, Italy has many cooperatives, not necessarily service cooperatives, yeah. but I guess also service cooperatives. Mm -hmm. And we had, we, we were teaching, and there was this article, I have to get it back, showing it calls, the, the I think the title is The Cycle of the Cooperative. 
it's not service cooperative, it's mainly about when there is a capitalist crisis yeah. and many private companies collapse, yeah. then there comes this. And cooperatives emerge because the workers try to save the, their jobs mm -hmm. and create yeah. cooperatives. So, yeah, there is a lot of but then, yeah. when the good years come back, some of these cooperatives became again private companies because some of the workers become capitalists themselves, some become owners. And yeah, they have a diagram I want to show you, but so please, right. please continue. So, so, yeah, you know, I and what he is trying to find is a number of cooperatives in Finland over the years. Uh, see, I saw that. Do you have that in English, that uh, presentation? This is my research, uh, master's thesis, but ah. I can translate it. <laughs> but this is the total number of cooperatives in Finland. Ah. It starts from 1904 until 2008. Yeah. All years are here. But this is also due to economic growth of Finland and uh, about the concentration of people. But still, it was quite deep in. Late so, late 80s, late 80s when, when we had this uh, financial market opening and economy was growing nationwide, like I think it was the second highest growth in the world during the 80s. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. it so? Yeah, it was. And it's exactly. uh, because, because it's the cooperative movement, it's not about capital, it's about participation, it's about yeah. identity, it's yeah. individual yeah. identity and the group yeah. identity. And, this is really interesting question because these things tend to be that people don't realize what they are actually a part of. But the I it's it's really polarized if you think about cooperative management boards <coughs> and the governing bodies who really are into this, who really want to promote it, who really really see it as a big thing. And that's the thing that I really myself think it. It, it works because we really have to, because all our employees, they know what, the, who, what, what we are, who owns us, and that they promote that idea to people, and it's going to, people just are not that interested until something goes wrong. I'm really, really, really 100% sure that if, if there would be some large disturbance, we would have a lot more people. In our general meeting, which we have experienced in recent years, also when we bought the sewerage networks and, yeah. and everything, yeah. there were like 50 people, of course, yeah. who were really interested. And to get the discussion going, you only need one one guy who who says something out loud, and then people really are involved in the discussion. They are act active listeners, at least. We in Finland, it came from mainly dairy, but also meat, meat industry and agriculture, agricultural cooperatives that we used to have limited age that how old you can be if you want to be in the board of cooperative. Because people who wanted to be part of something had like one cow and still were in the dairy cooperative board. So they started restricting it and put an age gap there. Which used to be in our case, it, first it was 58, and then we, before my time, we lifted it to 63, and during my time, first to 65, then to 68, and last year we, we removed it. Because, well, there are some practical reasons, just because people are not interested. We don't have that bigger problem, but I know that many. Other cooperatives have that that they cannot get people involved or get into decision making, and this is one thing. If I go back to what I said about the image and brand of water sector, yeah. we have really large discussion in this country going on that we have something which is called lack of professionalism, lack of knowledge in this sector. But yeah. I would like to argue that this is total crap, and the fact is that the best and the best guys, best people working, they are not interested in water sector. We don't get the best minds all the time. 
we don't have a lack of anything. We are really smart people in very many areas of work. These same people are the ones that we are. We should be fighting to get interested about water services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if our argument is that for our existence, the reason for our existence is that we are trying to achieve the minimum. In yeah, yeah, yeah. No one is interested. No one is motivated to be in this sector. And also, what this development with energy sector, these mergers of water utilities and electric limited companies is causing is that the guys working in the water utility they usually are in the maybe the second step from top mm. or the third they just get run over by the electrician guys yeah. and this is mainly because they have structure they have systems they have developed these asset management things organizations during the years because they have been involved in business. It has caused yeah. them that they have the advantage. They know something about organization yeah. and Yeah, but business. there's also the other other, yeah. other other very questionable matter because uh, there are some consultants and, 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 and others who promote the idea that uh, which is probably quite untrue. They, they are arguing that if you are putting water and electricity together, you will have a lot of synergies, which is most likely not true. The other point is that they are misusing the, uh, how, how would you say, they are ma making this what they call uh, uh, innovative accounting really in parentheses. In other words, taxation tricks like they did in, in, in Central Finland among others. Well, the result, result was that after they had uh, bought the electric, electricity company, bought the water utility and the result was that one, one of the highest prices in, in for the water utility customers. Hidden taxation has existed and will, will exist.